Thank you. Um, OK, so I am going to talk about a new approach for making progress on the log rank conjecture uh, using uh, tools from additive combinatorics. And this is a joint work with uh, Eli Ben Sasson, who was at the Technion when this work was done and is now at Microsoft Research New England and Shaka Lovett from here. And what I would like to do first is to explain what is the log run conjecture. So in the two-party communication complexity model, two parties, Alice and Bob, uh, wish to compute some function f from x cross y to 0, 1. And in this talk, I will assume that the image of all functions is in 0, 1. And in order, order to compute this function, and they want to compute this function on uh, inputs x and y, where x uh, is known only to Alice and y is known only to Bob. And in order to compute this function, they must communicate with each other according to some protocol. And in this talk, I will assume that all protocols are deterministic. And we define the communication complexity of a protocol as the maximum number of bits sent between the parties as part of the protocol uh, on worst case inputs. And the communication complexity of the function f is defined as the minimum communication complexity of a protocol uh, for computing f. Any questions so far? By the way, feel free to ask any questions you have. And sometimes it's uh, convenient to associate with every such function f a 0, 1 matrix M whose rows are indexed by the element of x and whose columns are indexed by the element of y, where the x, y entry of f of m equals f of xy. And we define the communication complexity of a matrix M as the communication complexity of the associated function f. And we also denote by rank R of m the rank of the matrix M over the reals. And we will sometimes also consider the rank of M over F2. <coughs> now, it is a well-known fact that the communication complexity of a 0, 1 matrix M is lower bounded by the log of its rank and is upper bounded by the, the rank, its rank over the reals. And it's a fundamental question to determine what is the true dependency of the communication complexity of a 0, 1 matrix M on its rank. And the log run conjecture due to uh, Lovas and Sachs from 88 uh, is that the gap here between the upper bound, uh, so this conjecture suggests that the gap here between the upper bound and the uh, lower bound is just polynomial or more precisely that for every 0, 1 matrix M, the communication complexity of the matrix M is polylogarithmic uh, in its rank over the reals. Is there a reason to take the reals and not the reals? Yes. Answer? So very good question. So maybe I will just write the conjecture for future reference. So the conjecture is that So the conjecture is that the communication complexity of a matrix M is polylogarithmic in its rank over the reals. And in general, this conjecture is not true over finite fields. So for example, over F2, one can take the inner product function. Which on, len on a pair of inputs of length N is defined as the inner product of x and y, modulo 2. And it is not difficult to see that the rank of this function, of the matrix associated with this function over the reals is n. And on the other hand, one can show that the communication complexity 
this function is also n. So the gap between uh, the communication complexity of this function and the log of its rank over f2 is exponential. Okay? But this, however, this does not contradict the log 1 conjecture because the rank of a uh, of this function over the reals is something like uh, 2 to the n minus 1, I think. But it's still lower bound, right? Uh, for n, so it's always a lower bound comprehensively. Uh, yes. So, so one thing which is always true that the rank over the reals is lower bounded by the rank in F2. Well, for a zero-one matrix, I will talk about this later, but for a zero-one matrix, the log of the rank over the reals is lower bounded by the log of the rank of F2. Also the, the upper bound, so it's, it's more the rank over any space, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, the, the, so we, we are interested. I'm not going to take much of your time, but the original conjecture, which is a related one, was made by a computer. Yes. On the this conjecture? conjecture. Yeah. So how, it, how was it found? Okay. So that's even more interesting than I thought whether a computer can give. A I don't know his name. Over <laughs> Okay, interesting. Any more questions? Okay, great. <coughs> okay, so this is the log run conjecture. And though some effort was made in a attempt to make progress on this conjecture since its introduction, till now not much is known regarding it. So in particular, the best lower bound known on the, the communication complexity of a matrix M in terms of its rank is log of the rank to some power t, where t is approximately 1.585 due to Nissan and Wiedersohn in 95, with an improvement to 1.631 due to Cushy-Levitz, also from 95. So the power, the power, the value of t is not so important, but what's important is that at least we know that the communication complexity is not linear in the rank. And as to upper bounds, <coughs> so the best upper bound uh, is the rank over 2 due to Kotlov and Lovaz from 96, uh, with an improvement to roughly 0.415 times the rank due to Kotlov from 97. And our main result is the following that assuming a well-known conjecture in additive combinatorics known as the polynomial feynman rusha conjecture, then the communication complexity of every 0-1 matrix M is uh, at most the rank of this matrix divided by the log of the rank of this matrix. So what is this polynomial feynman rusha conjecture? So maybe I'll write this also. Okay, so what is this polynomial feynman rusha conjecture? So suppose that A is a subset of F2 to the N, and from now on, all operations will be taking modulo 2 over the field of two elements. So for such a set A, we denote by A plus A the set of all elements of the form A plus A prime, where both A and A prime are in A. And 
it is not difficult to see that the size of a plus a equals the size of a if and only if a is closed under addition, which happens if and only if a is a subspace or an affine subspace, which in turn happens if and only if the size of the span of a equals the size of a. And the question is whether the ratio of the size of a plus a to the size of a also serves as a measure of how close is a to being a subspace. Or in other words, whether the fact that the ratio of the size of a plus a over the size of a is small also implies that the ratio of the size of span a over the size of a is also small. And a theorem by Rusha from 99 says that this is indeed the case, that if the size of a plus a is at most k times the size of a, then the size of span a is at most some uh, exponential function in k times the size of a. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, we we don't have any scalars in F two to the n. But okay. Um, so this theorem was improved by a series of uh, papers. Uh, the current state of the art result is a very very recent result due to Evan Zohar from two thousand and eleven, that says that if the size of a plus a is at most k times the size of a then the size of span A is at most 2 to the k over 2k times the size of A. And this actually can be seen to be almost uh, tight up to the factor of 2 over here. And the way to see that this is tight is just to take the set A to be a collection of uh, a linearly uh, independent vectors. They get for what? I see. Okay, I didn't know that. Interesting. Um, okay, so this example of taking A to be a set of linearly independent vectors also shows that uh, there must be some uh, exponential dependency in K in this, uh, in the upper bound on the ratio of the span of A to the uh, <coughs> size of the to the size of A. Uh, however, for many applications, one would like uh, the function here to depend only polynomially in k, and not exponentially in k. So the polynomial form and Rusha conjecture. Me, sorry, I'm sorry, to bother you. I'm no, no, no. Is there a okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, is there? Oh, my mistake. Sorry. Yeah, all, all right. k's are the same. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So the polynomial form and Rusha conjecture is that there exists a large subset a prime of a for which the ratio of the size of span a prime to the size of a prime is at most a polynomial function in k. And more precisely, the conjecture is that there exists some absolute integer r such that if the size of a plus a is at most k times the size of a, then there exists a pretty large subset a prime of a of size at least k to the minus r times the size of a, such that the size of span a prime is at most k to the r times the size of a prime. So maybe I write this conjecture also. So this is the conjecture. And a recent breakthrough in this conjecture was made recently uh, by Sanders in 2010. And Sanders proved a polylogarithmic version of this conjecture, where r is not a fixed integer, but it is still quite small. It's some, it is some polylogarithmic function of k. Any question on the PFR conjecture? OK, so how does the proof of our main result look like? So the main tool we use 
in order to prove our result is called approximate duality. And this uh, mathematical tool was introduced and studied in connection with the PFR conjecture in previous paper. And it was used there for uh, the construction of two source extractors. And the way our proof goes is the following. So what we do first is we prove that the PFR conjecture implies a improved, lower improved bounds on approximate duality. And we then use these improved bounds on approximate duality to achieve improved upper bounds on the communication complexity. And the first part is the main technical part of the paper. And the second part uses some uh, approach suggested uh, by Nissan and Vindersson in a paper from 95 for making progress or even resolving the log run conjecture. So my plan now is this. So I'll first explain what is approximate duality and now how it implies a upper bounds and communication complexity. And then I will move to the blackboard and try to explain as much as I can how uh, the PFR conjecture imply bounds on approximate duality. OK, so I will start by explaining what is approximate duality. So again, suppose that A is a subset of F2 to the N. And for such a set A, we denote by A perp. Yeah, it's perp. Uh, by A perp, the subset of all elements in F2 to the N, which are orthogonal to all elements in A. And for such sets A and B, which are subsets of 0, 1 to the N, we define the duality measure, which we denote DAB of the sets A and B, as the absolute value of the probability that uh, the inner product of two random elements, A in A and B in B, equals 1, minus the probability that this inner product equals 0. Sure. So why did you call it duality? Um, yeah, so good questions. So usually it is referred to the, um, as the discrepancy of uh, the inner product function. Uh, and I have two, two answers to this question. So one answer is that when we defined it, we didn't think about communication complexity and discrepancy, and this came uh, later. And the reason why we called it duality measure is that we claim that it actually measures how close are the sets to being contained in dual spaces. And the reason is roughly this. So if B, so suppose first that B is contained in A perp, then in this case, of course, we have that uh, the duality measure equals 1, because the inner product is always 0. And on the other hand, uh, it's not difficult to see that if the duality measure equals 1, then this means that B is contained in some a fine shift of A perp by some vector x. It's really an economic um, Yeah, I mean, I mean, th this is a weaker to be contained in some affine shift of A perp is weaker than be con being contained right, so in A perp. Yeah, that B is, yes, but the other. The other right. OK, uh, almost, yeah. So yeah, the idea is that having duality measure 1 actually says that A and B are contained in dual spaces. OK, and the question we asked ourselves is the following. What could be uh, said about uh, the duality, about the structure of A and B if the duality measure of A and B is quite large? Say it's larger than 0.99. And what we could prove is that in this case, there exist large subsets, A prime of A and B prime of B, such that the duality measure of A prime and B prime equals 1. And more precisely, we could prove the following theorem, that for every arbitrarily small constant delta, there exists another constant epsilon, such that if the duality measure is at least 1 minus epsilon, then there exist large subsets. A prime of A and B prime of B, such that the size of A prime is at least 2 to the minus delta N times the size of A, and the same goes for B, such that the duality measure of A prime and B prime equals 1. 
So note that the loss here in the sizes of A and B is quite large. It's exponentially uh, small in N. Uh, but what we can do is to take delta to be arbitrarily small constant. So the loss here is exponential, but arbitrarily small exponential loss. <coughs> now, yes, yeah, so a good question. So it's not tight, and we were, uh, I mean, able to improve this uh, theorem in our paper. So I will explain it in a minute. Uh, so one thing, it is conjecture that the same thing is true also when the uh, duality measure is very small. Not 1 minus epsilon, but very small, and especially when it goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. And in this talk, think of n as being very large. And a support to this conjecture is given by the following theorem. So this theorem says that the same thing is that assuming the polynomial Feynman Wusha conjecture, the same thing is true when replacing 1 minus epsilon with 2 to the minus epsilon n, which is quite small. This, uh, this goes very fast to zero as n goes to infinity. But it's clear that there exists epsilon that will be very close to zero, right? Uh, it's the same quantifiers. For every yeah. delta, there exists but some. Uh, the delta goes to zero, epsilon mm -hmm. will go also to zero, right? Right. So this, yeah. So it will be large, but uh, exponentially, la exponentially large, exponentially small large. <laughs> I don't know what to say. OK. Any more questions? OK. Um, so what we managed to do in this paper is to, uh, so our main technical lemma actually gives a new trade-offs between the value of the duality measure and the loss here in the sizes of the sets. And more precisely, the lemma is that assuming the polynomial from a Wusha conjecture, if the duality measure is at least 2 to the minus square root n, that there exist subsets, a prime and b prime of a and b respectively, such that the size of a prime is at least 2 to the minus cn over log n times the size of a, and the same goes for b, such that the duality measure of a prime and b prime equals 1. So what's the difference? So note that here the loss is 2 to the minus cn over log n, which is smaller than 2 to the minus delta n, so it's a smaller loss. But this, however, comes with the cost that the duality measure would be larger, because 2 to the minus square root n is larger than 2 to the minus epsilon n. So this gives some new trade-offs between. Yes, c is a multiple constant. Yes, c is a constant. There exists a constant c such that everything is true. So basically for sufficiently large n. I guess C depends on the specific limit and not entered on upper power. Yeah, so you can do more trade-offs. Uh, I mean, if you want to optimize this constant C, then you could uh, take this to be 2 to the minus n to the power of 1 minus alpha, for example. And you don't have to choose for uh, getting 1, right? I mean, I guess uh, this frequency amplification That if we manage to prove yeah, this for less to one. Yeah, you can go, let's say, to a constant, maybe, with low, smaller low. Oh, yes, yeah, probably so constant be the same. Be the same. More larger, I'm, I'm not aware of it. So straight up, can you get 2 to the minus n to the smallest power of n? Again, could you repeat the question? So you said there were trade-offs. Uh -huh. Could you do 2 to the minus n to the point 1 also? Or to the minus n to the point 1. Uh, I mean, I have to check, but I think uh, it's possible. I mean, uh, uh, then uh, this yeah, c will be larger. Point 0.9, yeah. Point nine, point 0.9. Yeah, so I think you could, you could do that, but then c would be larger. I mean, I'm pretty sure. Yes. OK, so this is a great question. So uh, we have some counter example that shows that you can't go here. You have to lose at least square root n in both sets. So you can't go below square root n? 
no, the counter example is a... What is the distance? What is ah, the difference? Ah, this, oh, this is champagne. This is champagne. Uh, so even a historical assumption, I mean, we have example where the duality measure is arbitrarily large constant, close to one, and still you have to lose two to the minus square root 10. It will be give roughly square root r in the communication complexity of n. But uh, yeah, using this kind of lemma, we won't get probably this kind of lemma over f2, we probably won't get more than square root r. More questions? So maybe I'll write also the main technical lemma for future reference. So first I'll write the duality measure. This is okay, so will I be able to? Easier than I thought. <laughs> okay, right? And did I do something? What happened? Ah, okay. Okay, and the main lemma is that if the duality measure is at least 2 to the minus square root n, then assuming PFR, So any more questions about duality measure? OK. Um, so before proving the main technical lemma, I want to show how it implies improved upper bounds on communication complexity. OK, so the main key uh, to, for understanding this is to define the discrepancy of a 0, 1 matrix M. And the discrepancy of a 0, 1 matrix M is the probability that a random entry equals 1 minus the probability that a random entry in the matrix equals 0. So if the discrepancy equals 1, then we say that M is monochromatic. It has only one number in its entries. And if the discrepancy equals 0, this means that M has the same, M is balanced. It has the same number of zeros and ones. And in their paper, Nissan and Vigdas and conjecture the following, that if a 0, 1 matrix M has rank at most R over the real, then there exists a large sub-matrix, M prime of M. So its size is at least 2 to the minus log a poly some polylogarithmic, 2 to the minus to the power of some polylogarithmic function in R times the size of M, such that M prime is monochromatic. The discrepancy equals 1. And in the same paper, they proved a pair of theorems that will be very useful for us. So the first <coughs> theorem is that, surprisingly, this conjecture is actually equivalent to the log run conjecture. OK, so in order to prove the log run conjecture, one would ha have to prove that every a 0, 1 matrix of low rank has large monochromatic submatrices. And in the same paper, they also uh, proved a weakening of this conjecture use the, using spectral methods. And the weakening is that if a 0, 1 matrix has rank at most r, th there exists a large submatrix, m prime of m, which is pretty large of size at least 
r to the minus 3 halves times the size of m. And its discrepancy is not 1, as in the conjecture, but it is still quite large. It is at least r to the minus 3 halves. So instead of proving that every matrix of low rank has large monochromatic rectangles, they prove that 0, 1 matrices of low rank has large submatrices of high discrepancy. OK. And what we show is the following, that approximate duality actually implies that this matrix M prime that is guaranteed by theorem 2 has large submatrix M double prime. And the size of M double prime is at least 2 to the minus CR over log R times the size of M prime, such that M double prime is monochromatic. So it has discrepancy 1. And in the same way that uh, the nissan, the nissan victor conjecture is equivalent to the log run conjecture. Sorry, yes? No, no, ah, I will ignore you, OK. <laughs> um, in the same way that the nissan victor conjecture implies the log run conjecture, this matrix M double prime that we find of size 2 to the minus CR over log R times the size of M prime, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. OK. Implies that for every matrix M, the communication complexity of M is at most CR over log R, which is our main result. Any questions so far? Are you going to tell Vito about theorem 2? Uh, I didn't plan to give um, details of theorem 2. It's mainly um, spectral methods, no, a reason. OK, so, so the size of M prime is more than enough. It's here 2 to the minus log r, and we can even, so the, the size here, no complaints. This is really more than enough. What is not enough that we need to find monochromatic sum matrix. And what? Uh huh. Right. You may, you may be interested in that. Then, then you get, uh, you know, some, some of trivial bias in your complete algorithm. Correct. So it's, uh, it's interesting to yeah, improve this, but. Uh, okay, yeah, I see. But to, to get, to get it, uh, the determination to one, to be more complicated. Yeah, we are interested only in determination protocols. Assuming PFR. Any more questions? OK, so now I want to explain how approximate duality implies this. It just requires some observations. So this is what we want to prove. We are guaranteed by this theorem 2, some, uh, some matrix M prime of discrepancy at least r to the minus 3 halves. And the rank of this submatrix M prime is at most its rank, it's, is at most the rank of M, which is at most R. And you want to show that there exists a large submatrix M double prime of M prime of size at least 2 to the minus CR over leg R times the size of M prime, such that the discrepancy of M double prime is 1. So M double prime is monochromatic. So our first observation is the following. So I mentioned it also earlier, that for a 0, 1 matrix M, its rank over the reals is actually lower bounded by its rank over F2. So in order to prove our goal, it actually suffices to assume that uh, the rank of M prime is small over F2 and to work over F2. And this will be 
uh, this will help us a lot. Yeah, but it may be a huge loss to, to Could be. give it up. And yeah, I mean, Yeah, working of two can give us at most a square root of r. So in order to, to make more progress, one would have to work maybe over larger, larger finite fields or over the reals or, yes. But for proving like new law bounds of on the communication complexity which are unknown, it suffices to work over two. I try to think a lot about this question. I didn't find yet good definition, but could be. Um, okay, uh, so another thing I want to stress is that it's not true that if the rank, not only it's not true, it's false, that if the rank of a matrix over F2 is small, then it has such large monochromatic matrices over F2. This is false. What is true that if a matrix has low rank over F2 and such a large discrepancy, then it has such, such mono, large monochromatic rectangles. I mean, I don't know even if it's true. I know that assuming PFR, it's true. Okay, but we need the assumption that the discrepancy of M prime is quite large. Okay. Great, so this is our first observation. And our second observation is that uh, if a matrix M prime has run at most R over F2, actually this works over any field, then there exist collection of collections of vectors U1 to UK and V1 to VL, which are subsets of F2 to the R, such that the IJ entry of M prime is the inner product between UI and VJ. Okay, so there are like many ways to see this. It's, for example, it's a consequence of the fact that every uh, matrix of rank R can be written as the sum of R matrices of rank one. Okay? And so why these observations help us? So the key for understanding this is that to notice that actually the discrepancy of M prime is the duality measure of these sets of vectors A and B. So, what are K and L? so K is the number of rows in uh, M, and L is the number of uh, columns in M. Yeah, they can be anything. It, it's just basically the fact that if M prime has rank R, then it could be written. Yeah, this is a K times L matrix. This is a K times R, and this is a R matrix L. So the uh, columns, the rows here are the element of A, and the columns here are the element of B. Okay. And one can see that the duality measure is actually the discrepancy of the matrix M prime. Any more questions? Okay, great. So our assumption was that this discrepancy or duality measure is at least R to the minus three halves. And then approximate duality imply that there exist large subsets A prime of A and B prime of B <laughs> that have duality measure one. And then uh, if we take M double prime to be the matrix obtained uh, uh, when the rows are restricted to the elements of A prime, the matrix which corresponds uh, to the rows of A prime and the columns of B prime, then uh, this this is a large sub-matrix of M prime that is monochromatic. Yes? Yes. So, yeah, so th these are like K. K rows and R columns and L columns and each one is of size R. Any more questions? Okay, so I think that now I will turn to the board and try to explain a, how much time do I have? Like 20 minutes? Okay, I'll try to explain as much as I can uh, how our main lemma, how PFR implies our main lemma. 
so can you type the projector? Thank you. So uh, what I would like to explain now is uh, how PFR implies our main technical lemma. And in order to do this, I will uh, need first to introduce some uh, additive combinatorics preliminaries. So the first thing I would like to explain is regarding the PFR projection. OK. so. We would like to use the PFR conjecture. And in many cases, when one wants to use the PFR conjecture, it is used uh, along with some theorem that is called the BSG theorem. And so, Balogh's Meredith Gower's theorem. And when you need it, and the cases where you need it is when, so sometimes you don't have the information that the size of A plus A is at most k times the size of a. What you do have is, the information you do have is that uh, if you choose two random elements in a, then their sum will lie with high probability in a small set. So the assumption in the Baruch's Meredy Gowers is that if you choose two random elements in a, then with probability At least epsilon, their sum will lie in some set S. And this set S has size at most k times the size of A. So I will uh, assume that epsilon is. is uh, a, I will use, both will not be constant, but it will be a very different range of parameters. So I will just incorporate it into the conclusion. So the conclusion from this is the loss that the loss here is now k over epsilon and k over epsilon. Okay. So this is one thing. Um, okay. And another thing is the, which I would like to explain is the spectrum. Do you see if I write here? Okay. It is one. Oh, yeah. Ah, maybe I should pull this up. Is this better? Okay, thank you. So I would like to defend the spectrum of a set. So for a set a subset B of F2 to the N, we define the spectrum the spectrum epsilon of B is defined as the set of all elements in F2 to the n, such that E, the expectation over all elements in B of minus 1 to the inner product between x and B, and e, absolute value is at least epsilon. So this spectrum and, spectrum and duality measure are actually more or less equivalent notions. So one thing to notice is that this duality measure can be written equivalently as the inner product over all, sorry, the absolute value of the expectation over all elements in A and all elements of B of minus 1 to the inner product between A and B. So given uh, this definition, one can see that if the, so if the duality so suppose that A is contained in spec epsilon of B. Then in this case, we have that the duality measure of A and B is at least epsilon. 
And on the other hand, for Markov inequality, we have that if the duality measure is at least epsilon, then there exists a large subset of A which is contained in the spectrum. So there exists a subset of A of size at least epsilon over 2A, say, such that A is contained. So it won't be spec epsilon, but say spec epsilon over 2. Okay. Here. Yeah, I cheated a bit. Yeah, because of the absolute value. Yeah, there is a factor of two. Never mind. Okay. Um, okay, so this is the spectrum. Um, and another thing. Okay, is some a theorem from prep previous paper, which is a version of approximate duality, if when, which applies when one of the sets ha has small span. So approximate duality for sets with small span. So this is a theorem from previous paper. And the term is that if the duality measure is at least epsilon, then there exists a subset B prime of B, which is quite large. So the size of B prime is at least epsilon square times the size of A times the size of span A times the size of B, such that the duality measure of A prime and B prime equals 1. Just A. Thank you. There is no A prime. Thanks. Uh, so this is some version of approximate duality, but it applies, it gives a good bound only if the size of span A is not much larger than the size of A. So this is a version of approximate duality that applies only when one of the sets is close to being a subspace. And in order to prove this, we used, I won't go into the proof, but it uses a Fourier analysis. OK. So we will use all these things. Uh, so now what I want to do is uh, is to uh, uh, tell you what is the uh, main idea in the proof. So proof over overview. So in order to prove the main technical lemma, what we do is that we establish a sequence of sets. So suppose that the duality measure is at least epsilon. And we will later want to set this epsilon to be 2 to the minus square root 10. And then we have a sequence of sets. So the first uh, set in the sequence will be just A, the intersection of A with the spectrum epsilon 1 of B, where epsilon 1 is is epsilon over 2. Okay, and as we have seen before, if the duality measures at least epsilon, then this uh, set A1 should be quite large, at least A times uh, epsilon over 2. Okay, so this is the first set in the sequence. And the next set in the sequence is a subset of A1 plus A1. And it is actually the intersection of A1 plus A1 with spectrum epsilon 2 of B, where epsilon 2 is something like epsilon 1 square over 2. OK, and we continue this way. So A3 would be the intersection of A2 plus A2 with the spectrum epsilon 3 of B, where epsilon 3 
is at least epsilon 2 square over 2, and so forth. Okay. Okay, and after we have this uh, sequence of sets, our proof goes by induction. So I'll go uh, into more details later, but roughly the idea is this. So PFR plus DSG plus approximate duality for small span. All these theorems imply that there exists a large subset. Ah, OK. I forgot something important, sorry. Sorry, OK, so now our main observation is this. So the main observation is the main benefit of working over F2 to the n instead of the reals. And the observation is just that for every i, the sets ai are of size at most 2 to the n. Okay, this is something that does not happen over the reals. So therefore, the sets cannot keep growing forever. They must stop, stop sometime. And in particular, there exists some integer t, where t is at most n over log k, such that the set a t plus 1 is at most k times the size of a. You can choose k, whatever you want. We will fix parameters later. OK, so just the sets cannot grow forever. I mean, at some step, uh, the last sets would, should be pretty small. OK? So this is just pigeonhole principle. And given the main observation, the proof goes by induction. So we have this set AT. So the base case is that there exists a subset A prime T of AT, which is large, and B prime T subset of B, which are both large, such that the duality measure of A prime T and b prime t equals 1. OK, that's the first step in the, in the induction. And then we continue this way. So it's not because of a, uh, because uh, this. Be because uh, here we found the subset of at, and I want to find the subset of a. That's why it's not what I want to put. OK, great. So this is the base case. And then we do induction, and we show that. And this is implied, by the way, by BSG and PFR and approximate duality for small span. Y yes, I mean. That's what you found, right? I mean, you stop there because you know that the span of 80 plus 1 is small. Exactly. And then I can apply uh, approximate duality for small sets to the set 80, right? So this is the base case. And this is where we use PFR. And then we continue by induction to show that there exists A prime t minus 1, ta which is a subset of 80 minus 1, and B prime t minus 1, which is a subset of b. So we prove this for t minus 1 and continue this way until we prove that there exists a subset a prime 1 of a1. And note that a1 is a subset of a. 
and B prime 1, which is a subset of B, which are large. Okay, so the first case we gave for P phi, and then we somehow uh, managed to uh, carry an induction. Any questions? Yes. First, uh, epsilon, like if epsilon starts with uh, like exponentially small to begin with, right? So I will write the parameters more explicitly, OK? Good question. OK, so now I will. OK, I should have done exercises before. <laughs> OK, Okay. so now I will explain more, more in detail the base case. OK, so we already know the main observation was that AT plus 1 is at most k AT. And in order to apply this uh, PFR, PFR together with this G thing, so we take S to be our set AT plus 1. And we want to show that with high probability, if we take two random elements from AT, then we will land in the set AT plus 1. Right? So in order to apply this, this G and PFR, we need to show that if we take two random elements in AT, then with high probability, the sum will lie in AT plus 1. And we will show that it's at least epsilon t squared over 2. OK, and AT plus 1, I remind you, is AT plus AT, the intersection with spec epsilon t, over t, epsilon t to the power of 2 over 2. So what we really want to show that if we take two random elements in AT, then the sum will be in the spectrum epsilon t square of t, epsilon t square uh, over two of b. Okay. Yes. Right. Uh, I mean, no, what, why I need epsilon 2? Because the, I know that AT is contained in spectrum epsilon T of B. So if I write here delta and delta square over 2, delta square over 2, that's what it is. OK, so how do I prove this? So this I prove using cauchy schwarz So instead of calculating the probability, I will calculate expectation and then uh, the lemma will follow from Markov inequality. So if I take two random elements, I take two random elements in AT, and I want to calculate this thing. Okay, I want to show that the expectation of this is epsilon t squared. OK, so note that this, the trick is to note that this is just the same as writing this. Right. Thank you. Why this is just because it's a uh, characters? I mean, this is just a uh, minus one to the a b times minus one to the a prime b. Okay, and now we can apply Cauchy-Schwarz to conclude that this is at least.
which is at least epsilon t square. Why? Because we know that A t is a subset of spec epsilon t of B. So the duality measure of uh, A t and B is at least epsilon t square. Any questions? OK, so actually this Cauchy schwarz is really a terrible thing to do because this is mainly the reason that our epsilon keep powering all the time. But somehow I don't know of a better way of doing so. OK, uh, so now we know that, uh, that a t plus 1 is at most k a t and that if we take two random elements from a t, their sum will la land with high probability in a t plus 1. And we are in the shape to apply this PFR plus BG, BSG. PFR plus BGD implies that there exists a subset a prime, a t prime of a t, which is quite large. That's least poly epsilon t over k times the size of a, such that span a prime t is at most poly k over epsilon t times the size of a prime t. Okay, just this is just the PFR plus BSG. And now we can apply the uh, approximate duality for small span because we know that this is true, so DAT, the duality measure of AT and B is at least epsilon, and we know that so also the duality measure of a prime t and b is at least epsilon because a prime t is a subset of a t. So we know that the duality measure of a prime and t and b is at least epsilon. And we know that the span of a prime t is small. So from approximate duality for small span, We get that there exists a subset B prime T of BT, which is pretty large. It's at least poly epsilon T over K times the size of B, of B such that D and A prime T and B prime T equals 1. OK, so I, I managed to prove the base case because I found a large subset A prime T of A and B prime of A T, sorry. Large subset A prime of T of A T and B prime T of B, T of B such that the duality measure equals 1. So this proves the base case. And as to your questions, what are the parameters? So we would like epsilon to be 2 to the minus square root n. And um, the thing which optimizes best the parameters is the uh, 10 kin k to be 2 to the minus cn over log n. Then we have this t t is n over log k. t is log n over c. And then Epsilon t is something like epsilon to the 2 to the t, which is a 2 to the minus n to the alpha. So the loss here is 2 to the minus cn over log n. That answer, does this answer the question? OK. Yeah, I mean. Uh, Yes, this this Cauchy Schwarz thing that uh, keeps powering epsilon is really, really the bad thing here. I mean, somehow. Is the limit to, to uh, square epsilon at every step? Does it make sense to also square k at every step, or it wouldn't matter? 
Um, maybe have it smaller, smaller, but you, you may have it too. You worry? And then can you give it to him? Yes, oh, yeah, we didn't it's manage. It's not a minus cell. I say it's good to bring piano or whatever. Right, thank you. So I don't know how much time I still have, if at all. It's about time, but I think so. So you want to say something, a word about the induction step? step. Yeah, okay, I can say. Yes, okay, so I can say. Um, Maybe I'll just draw some pictures. Uh, which one should I erase? Okay, maybe the base. Base case. Yeah, but maybe I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. So in the induction, we uh, so suppose we know that uh, that this is true for uh, for i, and we want to show so this is the hypothesis, and we want to show that. The same is true for i minus 1. So what we roughly do is the following. So we draw some graph g. And the element of g are all elements in a i minus 1. And the, the, we put an edge between vertex a and a prime in a i minus 1, <coughs> if their sum lies in this set a prime i, guaranteed by the induction hypothesis. So we have this graph g. And so this is the graph. And what we could prove is that this graph has a large connected component. So this is like connected component. And this connected component will be our set a prime i minus 1 that we wish to find. So this connected po component will be uh, the set a prime i minus 1. And we want to show that all elements in this set have a inner product this have co the same inner product with all elements in some set B prime I minus 1. And so what we do, it, we take some element A and and we know that this element A has inner product 0 has Either it has in a product zero with all element in B i, B prime i, or that it has, or that uh, it has in a product one with most element of B prime y. So suppose it has in a product zero with most element of B prime y. Suppose it has in a product zero with all elements of B prime i, never mind. Then we know that the inner product of this is zero. And then if we take some neighbor of it, then we know that the inner product of a plus a prime and b prime i minus 1 is always also 0. So because the duality measure is, is 1, so b prime i. And so if we know that the inner product of a with b prime i and a plus a prime with b prime i is 0, then we know that the inner product with a prime of b prime i is 0. And we continue this way to show that all elements in this connected component as inner product 0 uh, with all elements in this set. Okay, so it's, it's some 
Uh, I don't know how clear it was because it was fast, but it's some uh, argument about uh, large connected components in graphs. Okay. If the duality measure is uh, yeah, the duality one with the i prime basically lets you expect that there is not a lot if the wave is not having a lot of edges. edges. Uh, you mean that the fact that yeah. here it's one? Yeah. Yes, this helps us. Uh, maybe I haven't th thought about it. Maybe one should aim here to smaller. And if you have more edges, yeah. it's more dense, maybe you can get away with Yeah, more maybe we can. Head here for one minus epsilon say, and here for more. Actually, I, ne I it's a good yeah. question. I don't know. Yeah. So we have uh, questions for both questions. Could you one compare the degrees of the phase? This is not exactly how we define it. Okay, one is greater than zero. Right. right. You don't say that. Okay. okay. So really, it's okay. A2 is A1 plus A1, but somehow you get the trade off in these graphs and these things. So some elements in A1 plus A1 could have many representations of sums of two elements, and some could have a representation of sums of only few. So it's somehow you need to do some fusion of this so-called and let's look at the first so-called subset of A2, which has all of them have roughly the same number of representations of A1 plus A1, and somehow it's only the two. Yeah, yeah, we make sure that that A1 plus A1 is more uniform with respect to the number of representations in order to carry the induction step. Uh, regarding PFR, Lagrange, no, general life. <laughs> what? No, Lagrange conjecture. Lagrange conjecture. Um, don't have a good belief. Uh, I can believe that. Uh, I mean, going to square root n, I can believe uh, what about that this. Small balance? So it's, it's, it's good to push the quantum space. It's clear that the effort that we took uh, can you get no And is it weaker than this conjecture that quantum is polylog? Yeah, yes, it's right, weaker. Yeah, yeah. Because quantum is a stronger model. And what about if you say that if you go higher of that one entry among them, it, it, it takes a little bit longer while to be like an Arduino less than AM or something. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if it's simple, it can you say something about the example of a uh, high discrepancy? Yeah, yeah. Matrix, it's very uh, easy. Uh, it's uh, just, uh, I even don't have to write, it's all uh, vectors of, uh, right. yeah, yeah. So the discrepancy, I mean, birthday paradox or whatever, right. the discrepancy is a large constant that you can't find. You have a loss always of two to the minus square root. Is, is it true today that there is no, uh, I mean, people are saying that log rank is small, then no communication It's a good question. I actually never thought about it. Unbounded there or something? Never thought about it. <laughs> and unbounded there, question. you can find one representing a discrepancy and get an advantage. Right. Yeah. So maybe an amount error, maybe you can actually use the original result. What you, what this case maybe you yeah, I think the best is uh, yes. this uh, result that you know, you get, uh, yeah, 
for distribution of mm-hmm. testing, you get an advantage of uh, polynomial count. That's one of this is just the using the your theorem, yeah, right? That. So that's the best I know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that everybody thought about the alternate. Thank you.